holy and all-loving God, once more we say thank you for gathering us safely again into this holy place. We thank you for journeying with us this past season of Lent. And we thank you for bringing us here at the beginning of this week when we walk with your Son once more through his passion. We ask that you bless us this day and every day until we can meet again on Easter Sunday. In Christ's name we pray, Amen. 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 Have you ever been in a place in your life when you suddenly find yourself in a moment of unforeseen clarity? And the only words that can escape from your lips are, How did that happen? I have, several times actually. And each time I have to still myself as I look back and marvel at the fact that out of such confusion, which is often my life, could come such clarity. Well, this week, known as Holy Week on our church calendars, represents one of those times when we, along with millions of other people throughout the entire world, can utter the words, How did that happen? When we look at the events that lead us from today, Palm Sunday, through Holy Week, which ends with the crucifixion of Jesus on what's called Good Friday, and then the saddest day of the entire year, that next day, Saturday the day when all the hosannas and all the horrors of crucifixion have ended. We are left with nothing but hopelessness as the very dead body of Jesus lays cold in a tomb. I think we are used to seeing Palm Sunday as a day of great celebration. And indeed, it it, it was back then, and it still is. But perhaps not for the reasons we usually think. We associate this day with Jesus being king and riding into Jerusalem as a king and with children waving palm branches in his honor. And while the elements of that picture are true, The gospel story, in fact, tells just a slightly different tale. It tells a tale of great expectations and hosannas on Sunday and the acclamation, crucify him, on Friday. Probably, in many cases, by the very same people. It is a sobering reminder about what happens to a group of people when their expectations are not met. Expectations of a major triumph being raised at the beginning of the week, today, only by the end of the week to have those hopes dashed so that even Jesus' inner circle of disciples had denied him, deserted him, and betrayed him by late Thursday. And as for the crowds, the larger crowds, they turn ugly and want nothing more of Jesus except to see him die in a horrible way. What accounts for this incredible turn of events all in one week? How did all of this happen between today, Sunday, and Thursday, four days from now? That sent the disciples running, got the crowds fuming, and the religious and political authorities conspiring to kill off this not-so-run-of-the-mill troublemaker. 
Well, in a moment, we're going to review what happened between Sunday and Thursday. But before we do that, we need to realize something from the outset. That Jesus did not come to meet our expectations. Jesus came to meet our needs. And needs and expectations are very often two very different things. For Jesus did not come to defeat our foes, the people we don't like, and make us the most powerful and righteous in the world. He came to serve and to give his life to set us free from the power of evil that can even still enslave us today. That is the Savior we need. But that was not what the people were expecting. So let us begin today by looking at some of the background events of Palm Sunday. You know, one of the, one of the curious details I've always thought about this particular gospel story is this business about the cult. I mean, it's, it's mentioned like in two or three sentences in a row. They could have just mentioned it once. What's the big deal about this little cult that Jesus is going to ride into Jerusalem? And for years, you know, scholars and preachers have pondered why so much attention is given to this detail. And this week, I think I finally saw it for what I think it is. A very simple statement about what Jesus needs. You know, when the disciples asked Jesus what they should tell the owner, if asked, why are you untying my colt? Jesus simply says to tell them, the Lord needs it. Sometimes I can get so caught up with my needs that I don't even think about what God might need from me. And so for years, I think I've missed this small point or overthought it, actually preferring the story as it's told in Matthew's Gospel instead of Luke's, because it's Matthew who explains the whole thing out, and, and we learn the significance of the cult, which is that Jesus is fulfilling yet one more prophecy. Remember, Matthew wrote about filling, fulfilling all these Jewish prophecies, and this is one more from the prophet Zechariah, who wrote, Rejoice, O daughter Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem! For your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey. And he shall cut down the kings of war and shall command peace, shalom, to all the nations. So when Jesus ends up riding into Jerusalem today, he rides in as a prince of peace and not a king of war. And the great irony, of course, is that the crowds don't get it. Which is why in Luke's Gospel, a few sentences after what we read today, Jesus weeps as he begins his journey toward Jerusalem because he knows the people want war and not peace. They want a mighty king and not a humble servant, a big man of retaliation and, and not one of humble compassion. And so it was all of those expectations that were dashed and then set into motion the events of Holy Week that led to Jesus' death by crucifixion. The people wanted and expected a, a violent uprising against the Romans, kick them out. Mm -hmm. But what Jesus delivered was the sacrifice of his own life to reveal the ultimate glory of God, not in his death at the hands of others, but in his resurrection. 
So let's look at Holy Week and all the events that took place that, that had the effect of changing these wonderful shouts of Hosanna to the horrible cries of crucify him. Start with today again, Sunday. Jesus rides into, to, into Jerusalem to the shouts of Hosanna and all the expectations we just talked about that surrounded such a triumphal entry. And think about this as we go day by day. So that's today. Well, tonight, before you go to bed, think about the fact that, you know, after today, Jesus returns to Bethany, that little town right outside of Jerusalem, to go visit with his good friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus once more. And it's only been a few days since Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So he goes back to see them once more tonight. And then tomorrow morning, Monday morning, we all get up to go to work. Jesus got up and returned to Jerusalem and went to the temple there, and that's the day he saw all these shameful practices being conducted in the temple and so he overturns the vendor's tables, fashions a whip out of some cords, and drives out the money changers. That's tomorrow morning. And I imagine the people who were shouting Hosanna today were once more rooting for Jesus on Monday as he started to clean house a little bit. Tuesday morning, we open up our food pantry. But think about Jesus, Tuesday morning, goes back to the temple once more. And he gets questioned harshly by all the religious leaders for what he did Monday morning there. How dare you do this? They begin to ask him, what authority do you have? You know, what, by what right can you come in here and do these things? And instead of fashioning another whip out of cords and driving out these old hypocrites, which I'm sure the crowds would have loved also, he takes a different tact and answers their questions with questions of his own about their understanding of the authority of heaven and of God and of God's prophets. And he told them stories and parables about the, the kingdom of God and who it is that is worthy of being counted among God's people. And some people, especially the ones who had already counted themselves as the ones worthy of everything, some of them began to realize, as Jesus was speaking, that Jesus might be talking about them here and that they may be the ones that have a hard time come Judgment Day. Well, as you might imagine, this was not what they were expecting. <clears throat> so for the people listening to all of this, this truly was the beginning of the turning point in the week. When it became clear that Jesus was not going to meet their expectations you know, of an uprising against the common enemy, the Romans. But rather, Jesus was going to meet our needs as the humble servant all the way to the cross and into a tomb. Well, this is just too much for most people. And so they deserted him, for what they saw was just a bunch of capitulation and dashed expectations by one more person who's not going to do what I want them to do. For only Jesus knew that resurrection was on the other side of all of this. So they desert him, conspire against him. That's Tuesday. Wednesday of Holy Week which sometimes is called Spy Wednesday, 
because this is the day that Judas on the side goes and conspires to hand Jesus over to the authorities all for his precious 30 pieces of silver which I looked up the, the value of silver in today's money a silver coin is about $20 right now so $600 Jesus was betrayed for $600. Barely one month's mortgage or rent for a lot of people. Now Jesus himself probably spent Wednesday back in Bethany. Not really sure. This time for the final goodbye to his friends there. But we do know what happened Wednesday evening. It's the story we read last week, actually. That's the the night that Mar- Martha cooks the big meal and Mary anoints Jesus with that very expensive oil. Not one month's rent's worth of oil, but an entire year's salary worth of oil. So great was her love for Jesus that she was able to see what he needed that night. And then comes Thursday. We're all kind of used to the Holy Week kind of beginning on Thursday, but there is a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Well, Thursday. Holy Thursday, we call it. Which marks the beginning of this ancient time known as a a triduum, tri doom, (laughs) three days that take us through the preparation of the Passover meal with his disciples the reorientation of the Passover meal into the Last Supper, which we continue to this very day as Holy Communion, to the betrayal and arrest of Jesus, his phony trials, his humiliation, his scourging, his very different parade through Jerusalem, being forced to carry his own means of execution to the crucifixion itself, his suffering, his dying, his being laid in a tomb, and a large stone being rolled over the entrance to mark the finality of what just happened. Those are the events of this time we call Holy Week. Beginning today, with high expectations, and end on Saturday, this coming Saturday, with his disciples hiding in fear and sobbing the words, how did that just happen? How on earth did we allow that to happen? Well, my friends, as we prepare to journey once more into this most holy of weeks, let us remember not just the hosannas of Palm Sunday and then skip directly to the hallelujahs of Easter morning. Let me let us remember and seriously contemplate the day-to-day activities that Jesus went through and let us walk the path with him. If ever there was a time in life to really take stock of what is important in our lives, this would be the week to do that. I mean, even if we've been doing that our whole lives, really take time this week to examine our our own values and our own beliefs and, and ask ourselves, are we prepared to have God meet our needs? Or are we still just sitting around expecting God, demanding God to meet our expectations? So it's fine to take our joys and our triumphs and ride alongside Jesus today. 
But let us also go to the Garden of Gethsemane and pray our own sorrows and fears on Thursday. And then no matter what, do not desert Jesus on Friday. In fact, I truly hope every single person here comes back here Friday evening and, and go with us to the cross once more and allow him to once more take our fears and our sorrows upon himself. Don't do that from afar. Come here to this holy sanctuary on one of those most holy days of the year, one hour, an hour to allow your hurt and your grief and your resentment to be buried in the tomb with Jesus' body and allow ourselves to experience all of these things that accumulate during this holy, holy week. Because it's only if we really do those things and remember them and act them out in our own lives that we can really gather together next Sunday morning and truly celebrate what Easter really means, which is the resurrection of the one who comes in the name of the Lord, our source of eternal resurrection, of hope, peace, love, and joy. Amen? Amen. 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 Will you pray with me, please? God of our very lives. Six weeks ago, we gathered in this place to begin our Lenten journey. We reflected on our mortality, on our need for each other, and our need for you. Since that day of ashes, we have journeyed day by day to Jerusalem to the procession of palms and hosannas, to the temple and to the streets, to the Garden of Gethsemane and what lies beyond. God, we are grateful that we have not been alone on this way. We are grateful that you have been with us all the while, supporting us even as you comfort us. And we are grateful that we have had others as our traveling companions, You have created us to be in community with each other. And we thank you for this sacred community, cast in your image and shaped by your love. You have shown us, God, what is right and just. You have shown us what it means to love you as you love us. In Christ, you have shown us what it means to give everything to this sacred calling, to live lives of obedience, humility, and love. Lord, may we live our lives with such determination and focus that we may find the courage to lay aside the pleasures, comforts, and needs of our own lives in order to give to others. God, we ask that you give aid to all of those who mourn or need your comfort today and bless us with a renewal of your Holy Spirit within us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen.